the theory seminar. So I will, um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> How can it be uh, here? Right, so I will speak about count, I will, I will speak about counting Sidon sets uh, containing brackets n. That means the integers between one and n. And uh, I will use the result, the results about counting um, to prove some results about a, a certain extremal problem, actually a probabilistic extremal problem. And uh, depending on how much time I kind of uh, can do uh, these two things, uh, I will speak a little bit about some further stuff. Namely, I will talk about infinite Sidon sets. And uh, maybe I'll mention a notion uh, which kind of we invented and we would like uh, people to kind of investigate because uh, if you could find nice, if you could find dense, uh, strong Sidon sets, then we would be able to say more about this extremal, infinite extremal problem. And then towards the end, at the very end, I will say something about BH sets. So I will focus the whole lecture on uh, Sidon sets, so H equals two. Right, and so all of I will uh, speak here uh, comes come from some papers uh, with these collaborators. So Domingos de la Monica, Sanjun Lee from Kyung University in Seoul, uh, Korea, Car Carlos Gustavo Moreira, from IMPA, Rio de Janeiro, Vojta Rodol from Emory, and Vojtek Samoti from Tel Aviv. Right, so in this seminar, I'm sure I don't have to define Sidon sets, but let me spend five seconds doing it. So a set of integers S uh, is a Sidon set. If all the pairwise sums, so sums of the form A plus B with A and B in S are distinct. So all of these pairwise sums are dis, uh, different. Okay, so there is a natural extremal problem that you can consider for Sidon sets. Namely, if you consider a Sidon set containing brackets n, you can ask uh, how big such a set can be. Uh, and this maximum is this function f of n. So it's a natural extremal problem for Sidon sets uh, living in brackets n. Now it's uh, very easy to get a bound of the form square root n, so very quickly. So if you consider all the sums, when you consider the sums a plus b with a and b in s, of course these sums are in this set from two to two n, and uh, they are supposed to be all different. So by pigeonhole, you see that the number of such pairs, which is size of s plus one choose two, uh, has to be less than two n, because otherwise you would have the same sum twice. Uh, anyway, so if you look at this equation, then you get that uh, S has size at most two root 10 or something like that. Actually, if you consider differences, you get slightly better because you get square root of two N, but never mind. Uh, the fact is that uh, this extremal function F of N is known asymptotically, so up to one plus little o one since the 1940s, as you see here at the bottom uh, of the slide. Okay, so f of n is one plus little one root n. Now, uh, another problem that you may consider about Sidon sets is, uh, is the problem of estimating how many of them there are. So let me use, let me write z of n for the number of Sidon sets s containing brackets n. So that is z of n. Very good. Uh, now this problem, uh, is a natural problem. And it was asked in kind of in more in general by Cameron and Erdős uh, in, this, in the paper that you see here. So on the number of sets of integers with various properties. So this paper is not only about Sidon sets, it's about, uh, it's, it's kind of a class of problems. So they say, uh, they say here the in the introduction that a number of questions in combinatorial number theory concern, concern the maximum number of integers uh, in brackets n satisfying some constraint. So for instance, not containing a solution to a specific equation, right? 
so here is the problem. The, here is the extreme, the extremal problem. What is the maximum size of such a set? Now, another related question is, uh, what is the number of such subsets? Uh, and now they have an initial observation. And the observation is as follows. So suppose you have a family A of, of um, subsets of brackets N satisfying this constraint. Uh, usually these constraints are such that if, uh, if a set A satisfies this property, any subset of it also satisfies it. So they consider here curly A to be a set closed undertaking subsets. So if I'm, in my case, I'm talking about curly A to be the set of Sidon sets contained in brackets N, right? Uh, now, suppose you know that the maximum size of a member of curly A is M. Then uh, you have the following two bounds. So for instance, if you fix one such set in curly A of M elements, if you take all subsets, you get members of curly A. So curly A is at least two to the M. Also, if you count all sets of size at most M, you get this uh, summation of binomial coefficients. So you have these uh, rough bounds on the size of your family curly A uh, in terms of the maximum size of a member of curly A, right? Uh, okay, so later on in the paper, or early on in the paper, they talk about Sidon sets. So curly A is a set of Sidon sets. And since we know that Sidon sets contained in brackets N have size uh, one plus little one root N, just the argument that we saw in the previous page tells us that the number of Sidon sets is between this, two to the root N, two to the one plus little one root N, and n raised to the one plus little one root n. So the only difference is in the base. One is two and the other one is n in the case of Sidon sets, right? Uh, with exponent root n. So here in, on this page, I just rewrote the same thing. Uh, so let me just go straight to the end. So at, at the bottom of the, of the slide, you see zn, the number of Sidon sets is between two to the root n and to the big O root n log n, right? And uh, so Cameron and Avdush say that um, it would be interesting, it's interesting to know whether this uh, bound, uh, this quantity, the size of this curly A in general is closer to the lower bound or is closer to the upper bound. So the reason is that if the size of this family curly A is closer to the lower bound, or let's say very close to the lower bound, then maybe that kind of says that the big guys in curly A it's tell you everything. So you know something about the structure of the members of curly A. So in the case of Sidon sets, we would know that Sidon sets, all Sidon sets belong to some smaller limited number of Sidon sets of maximum size. Anyway, so it's, it's, uh, it's great if you know that you, if you are close, very close to the lower bound. And uh, in that paper, they kind of say that uh, in the case of Sidon sets, it's not quite like the lower bound, but they say, they ask in general, so which one is closer to the truth, this lower bound or the upper bound. And uh, our first theorem uh, is that we are closer to the lower bound in the sense, as you see in theorem one. So Zn is at most, to raise to some constant times root n. Uh, right, so that observation was that the number of Sidon sets is between these two bounds and we are closer to the lower bound, except that we don't get one plus little one, we get some constant C. Now, uh, this theorem was also proved by Saxton and Thomason using their kind of in the context of hypergraph containers. So they kind of applied their method. Uh, and since they applied their method without any specific tweak into Sidon sets, they got some large constant, like they got something like 55 and we get something like 2.6. But the point is that, uh, yeah, if C were one, it would be very interesting. One plus a little bit would be very interesting. We can prove 2.6. 
Now, uh, it's actually a bit of a surprise uh, that the constant is definitely not one. So in the same paper, Saxton and Thomason um, I'm sorry, the page is stuck. <laughs> is it uh, stuck? So I would like to. <coughs> well, the page is not moving. Yeah, sorry. Um, hmm. um, what can I do? So let me, ah, yes. Um, let me just check whether anything is happening with my computer. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so let me. Oh. Yeah, so we are here. We are. Let me try to continue. So we have we have this uh, upper bound for the number of Sidon sets. It is at most two to the constant root n. Now, uh, I said it's a little bit of a surprise that uh, have actually a fairly simple argument shows that the constant is not one. So it would be lovely if it were, but it's not. It's more like two to the one point is at least two point two raised to one point sixteen f of n or root n, right? So the truth in the case of Sidon sets is that it's not, you're not really at the bottom, you're a little bit up, but the function in the, in the exponent is root n. Uh, I will not talk about this blob construction by Saxton and Thomason because later on there will be something slightly similar maybe, we'll see, depends on how much time I will have, uh, but let me continue. Now, I would like to talk about a refined version of this counting problem. Namely, I would like to fix the size of the Sidon set that I'm counting. So now I'm interested in Sidon sets, contained in brackets n again, uh, of size t. So now I have a function with two parameters, z and t. Okay. And uh, our theorem for z and t is, as you see here in theorem three, so the bound for this number is, uh, as you see here, now, so let's see. So this bound is true for large at largish t. So t has to be at least 2s0 and s0 is something like cube root n log n, right? So this upper bound is true, kind of it starts to, to bite when t is a little bit above cube root n. Uh, now, I will say something what about what happens below root cube root n, but uh, the, 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 the theorem is this. So uh, let me focus on largish t. Now, again, let's look at this upper bound z that we have for z and t. Uh, now, there is some little stuff at the beginning, this n raised to three s zero, but s zero is something like cube root n and I'm thinking of t which is larger. So for instance, t could be n to the two fifths or something like that. So the important term here in this upper bound is the second uh, thing, is this 200 n over t squared raised to the t. So this is the upper bound for z and t. Uh, we have a matching lower bound. So we have a bound of the form constant n divided by t squared to the t. Uh, well, the constant is different, it's not 200 in the lower bound that we get. And also we don't have this little thing at the beginning, this n to the s0. But anyway, the main term is kind of the same, n divided by t squared to the t. Uh, let's see. So of course, let me, before I, I go on, I should say that this lower bound of course is true. It cannot be true uh, for t bigger than fn, because there are no Sidon sets above fn, because fn is the maximum size of a Sidon set, uh, we can prove this lower bound for uh, some epsilon times fn. Uh, okay, uh, right. 
Now, this is kind of uh, looks technical, but there was some reason why we wanted to have one, why we wanted to count seed onsets of a fixed size. And that has to, has to do with the extremal problem that I will consider next. Um, let me kind of uh, just highlight the numbers again, sorry. So again, uh, I'm, so the range of interest for the size of the set is this is so t grows faster than n log n cube root and it has to be less than root n or no, grow slower than root n and for those we know that the number of seed on sets with that number with that size with t elements is this uh well is this this is just a reformulation of appeared of what appeared in the previous page and uh it makes sense to compare this number with the total number of sets of size t inside the brackets n, namely this binomial coefficient n choose t. So you get this uh, factor here. So constant divided by t to the t. So that is the fraction of t element seed on sets that you have in brackets n. OK. Now I said I would say something about smaller t. So now suppose t is little o cube root n, then the number of seed on sets is actually, well, it's certainly at most n choose t, but it's something like one, it's one minus little o one to the t fraction of n choose t. Well, of course it's small, right? So it, I say it's one minus epsilon, one minus little o one. So it's less than one raised to the t. So it's, a, it's kind of exponentially small in t, but the factor that you see here uh, is very different from the factor that you see on top, this constant divided by t to the t. There's a t in the denominator, right? So, so if you count seed on sets by size, uh, something happens at cube root n. Below cube root n, kind of the, you have a largish fraction of t's T element subsets of brackets n being seed on. Uh, but if you go above it, you have some super exponentially small fraction being seed on. Right? So this is kind of what I try to say here in these, uh, in these three lines. So there's some change at n over one third. Okay. Um, so Oh, this little one. Actually, I think one could do. So the proof of this is something like the following. So cube root n is the point where a seed on quadruplets, so quadruplets A, B, C, D, such that A plus B equals C plus D, become becomes popular. So after n to the one third. So below n to the one third, the number of such quadruplets uh, for a typical set on t elements is not many. So you kind of can destroy all of them. So there is, it's, the set is essentially all of, all of it uh, is seed on. You just have to erase some elements. Now the number of elements you have to erase hmm, I think in our calculations is any given constant, but it's possible that you can write something more explicit, some explicit function as a function of how small, how far you are from n to the one third. Okay, uh, now, so here's the generalized the probabilistic extremal problem, which was the kind of the motivating uh, reason for counting seed on sets by size. Uh, so, uh, so the idea is the following. So we consider now a set X in brackets N. And now I would like to know what is the biggest size of a seed on set containing X? So max size of S with S containing X. So previously X was brackets N. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, now, so of course this is a, for you have uh, you can you can pick your favorite x and consider this problem but of course it would be very difficult for various 
several types of x, uh, we'll do something very basic. We consider a random set with m elements. So now I will, so in other words, so again, I will consider x to be brackets n index m. So brackets n sub m uh, means the following. We take, uh, we consider, maybe I should do like this. So here is brackets n. Now we select a set of size m randomly in brackets n. So this random set here is uh, denoted brackets n, m, right? And all m sets are considered equiprobable. So we just take uh, one uniformly at random. That's my random model. And I would like to know how big, how big a Sidon set you can find inside this m. Right, so how big can this S Sidon be? Okay, uh, since brackets N M is a random object, uh, this F, uh, F and M is a random variable, so it fluctuates, right? Uh, what we would like to know is the typical value of this quantity of this random variable. So in other words, so again, I would like to know the typical value of this uh, as n tends to infinity. And of course, uh, I should consider some m which grows with n also. And what will be interesting is how we vary uh, the order of growth of m. Now, again, I said that at n to the one third, something kind of happens. And uh, so here is, I'm saying this again. Uh, if m is little o cube root n, uh, then this quantity here is about m. So let me go back to the previous picture. So in the case that m is below cube root n, so this Sidon set is actually kind of, oh, I didn't mean to change color. Kind of, it's essentially everything. Uh, now this is something simple to prove. Now, uh, something interesting happens really at this n to the cube root n, cube root n point, namely, uh, we have the following. This f of brackets n m becomes little o m with, with high probability, with probability that goes to one as n goes to infinity. It's 530. So if m is above cube root n, this is little o m. Uh, just this statement that uh, this function f is little o m with high probability, follows from some general theorems known as transference theorems by Colon and Gauss and uh, Schacht. But in fact, you can say uh, what this little o m is. So that's kind of uh, what we find interesting. Uh, now, for me to say how much, so what that little o m is, uh, I have to Mm, introduce uh, some piece of notation. Let me consider this function b, b of a, which is this piecewise linear function that you see here on the right. Okay, so that's b of a. Now the theorem uh, is this. So again, we are considering brackets n m. Now let's consider the, func the m to be this function here. It's n to the a. So you select a random set of size n to the a in brackets n. What is the, what is the largest uh, Sidon set that you can find in such a random set with high probability is n to the b, right? So that is the statement. Uh, so again, so you have here, uh, let me already draw the random set brackets n m. So this is a set of size m. Right, and we said we are, we are interested in finding Sidon sets inside it. Okay, uh, the point is if this big set, the random set has size n to the a, this Sidon set has size n to the b, and b is b of a, and uh, b of a is this function that you see here on the right. Now, so, so, so let's see, in this graph, uh, this part of the graph, 
Uh, so when A varies from zero to one third, you kind of see, it's kind of see that this should be the behavior. This has to do, I mean, this is already stated, this was already stated before. Let me go back one page, uh, two. So it's the second point here. If M is below N to the one third, essentially all of the set is a Sidon set. So that is kind of uh, what you see here in this interval from zero to uh, one third for the parameter A. Now, for random sets of size n to the one third to n to the two thirds, uh, the size of this Sidon set, it's kind of, it doesn't grow, it's flat. Uh, so the random set of course grew a lot, right? It went from n to the one third to n to the two thirds, but this, the larger Sidon set inside stayed the same. It's kind of n to the one third. Okay, and then again, it's some kind of something happens at n to the uh, two thirds, namely when a is equal to two thirds, uh, the size of the largest Sidon set inside your random set grows linearly with slope one half uh, until you hit one half. Well, of course, we know that when a is one, so when you have the whole set brackets n, the larger Sidon set has size n to the one half, right? So B is one half in that case. So we should, uh, it's, it's clear that uh, we had to hit this point in the graph. And uh, well, that's how we kind of hit that point. So we go, we, we grow linearly, coefficient one, and then we stay flat, and then we go up with uh, coefficient one half. Uh, okay, so this we kind of find interesting. Uh, and now I will say maybe a little bit about the proof of this. Um, actually, since I started talking about counting and then I said that uh, the motivation was to use this counting to prove this previous theorem, let me just really go to the counting part where we use the counting part. So, so that means, uh, let me discuss this point here. So this is the point in which you have A between two thirds and one. So let me go back to the graph. So it's this. Um, I couldn't see the, could you, would you like to open the microphone and ask? Uh, somebody asked something on, in, in the chat. Hi, uh, yes. So um, I was wondering, <clears throat> Is there an explicit quantity which determines the change in size at uh, A equal one third or A equal two third? You mean whether we know more precisely what kind of uh, functions we have at these two points? Or you mean some explanation of what, what, why this happens or? Uh, yes, so I mean some explanation like if there is um, a sort of energy, let's say, will, which regulates when um, the sites change at these two points. Right, so this one third point, we understand combinatorially well, I would say. Um, so this is the first break point. The second break point, I, we, we can just derive from the, from the upper bound on the number of sets. So I have no kind of nice intuitive explanation why there should be these two breakpoints, um, especially the second breakpoint. The first breakpoint I think is intuitive. Uh, so let me say something about the first breakpoint. So when A is one third. When A is one third, the number of Sidon quadruplets, namely, uh, quadruplets of integers of the form a, uh, a, B, C, D, such that A plus B equals C plus D, becomes a, of the same order as the number of elements in your random set. So if you want to get rid of them, so before, before it, before the number of such quadruplets uh, is kind of comparable to the number of points in, in your random set, so in N, then it's trivial that you can just get rid of them and you have a huge, uh, huge um, Sidon set inside. Now, if you're above, 
Of course, you have to work to show that uh, to destroy all of them. I mean, it costs a lot to destroy all of them, right? But uh, so that's kind of the only explanation at one third. And at two thirds, it would be nice to have some good explanation. I don't, I cannot say something deterministic about X, some uh, about the random set uh, and say, well, for such random sets, then you have such and such a behavior. Yeah, okay, I, thank I'm you. Sorry. Okay, so as I said, so the, the crucial point uh, is, so this two thirds and the, the once you have the bound, uh, you remember, you, you may remember that the number of Sidon sets of T elements is this, is of the, for, of the form N divided by T squared to the T, right? Well, of course, if uh, T is, uh, much more than n to the, well, n log n cube, and let me just write it this way. Um, so we are in the range that you can apply this. Now you can just count the number of Sidon sets. You can count the, you can estimate the expected value, the expected number of T element Sidon sets in your random set. And it so happens that this number uh, can be estimated by this m divided by t squared to the t. And of course, if t is above um, square root m, you get a number less than one. So you don't have such Sidon sets, right? t element Sidon sets, because the expectation is small. So with probability equals to one, you have none. Uh, okay, so it's just uh, the first moment it's one first moment calculation once you know the number of Sidon sets. As I said, we don't know anything uh, structural about square root, about brackets and M to, to be able to say such a thing. Anyway, so, so this, this calculation I just showed, I'm, I'm not so sure it's so clear, but uh, in the end, you see here that uh, the breakpoint is N to the A divided by two. So you can apply this calculation for any A between two thirds and one third in this graph, and you obtain the upper bound in this range of A. Of course, you have to prove the lower bound also, and the lower bound comes from some fairly simple construction, but I, let me not talk about that. Okay. Um, now I will say just a very few words about how, to, how we obtain the estimate on the number of T elements Sidon sets. So this bound here, uh, we translate this to a, some graph problem uh, and we use uh, counting um, independent sets in this graph. So we translate this problem to some problem about independent sets uh, or oh, an independent set in a graph or a stable set in a graph is a collection of vertices that spans no edge, no two points adjacent we would like to count such independent sets of a given size. So independent sets or stable sets of size little s in the graph G, uh, we want the estimates for this number. Now here is a kind of the main lemma. This is uh, purely about graphs. Let me just highlight kind of what's the hypothesis and what is the kind of conclusion, but I will not so much go into the numerical details here. The combinatorial hypothesis you need in your graph uh, is that is this thing, it's kind of uh, statement two. So you have this graph G uh, and you know that in this graph G, the edges, uh, so this graph is dense is in, in, the, in the sense of two. Okay, what does two say? Two says that if you consider a set A of vertices, which is lower bounded by some parameter R. Well, then the number of edges you see in this set A is at least beta times the total number, total number of edges you could see in A. So you have the set A, it could have H's two edges, but you have a beta fraction of it. So in other words, I mean, you can think of this as, so you have this graph G, right? And uh, anytime you pick a set A, which is of reasonable size, you see inside here some density beta of edges. This is the hypothesis. Well, if that's true, 
then you know that the number of independent sets in this graph is uh, upper bounded as in three. Now, let me, okay, so let me try. So this graph, think of this graph as being a, a random graph with density beta. Then uh, what, you, what you have is something like the following. So if you have a vertex here, some vertex X, let's say, right? You would see in its neighborhood, something like beta times n vertices. My graph has, oh, my graph has big n edges, uh, big n vertices. So you would have beta times n uh, neighborhood here, right? Now think of, uh, let's try to think how to build independent sets in this graph. So maybe this vertex X that I just chose is a vertex that I would like to put in my independent set, right? Well, if I put X in my independent set, I cannot put any of the neighboring points, any of these beta n points, right? So at the beginning, I have this graph on big N vertices, but once I decide to put X in the, in the independent set, I exclude beta fraction of the vertex set. So in other words, I go from one to one minus beta. At the beginning, I could choose any vertex. I had choice, 100% of choice, but now I lost beta percent. So I have one minus beta because of X, right? Now, suppose you do this Q times, and suppose you can do it in such a way that every time you kind of lose uh, this beta fraction, then you would get something like this one minus beta to the Q kind of remaining vertices, right? So I have this e to the minus beta q kind of re redu reduction factor. And uh, this kind of, this theorem kind of says, this lemma kind of says that uh, because of this hypothesis two, you can more or less force this when you consider independent sets. So in the end, after you try to build your independent set using q vertices, you have remaining, uh, the remaining space where you can pick the next vertex is of size R. So this more or less, I don't know, I hope, explains this bound. So Q vertices you choose in an arbitrary fashion, but the remaining M vertices, you can only choose from this restricted set of size big R. Anyway, I, I'm sorry, this is kind of rough, but uh, so this is some interesting lemma about number of independent sets in everywhere dense graphs. Now, let me skip this. Uh, so how can we use this to count Sidon sets? Well, there's a natural way of defining a graph from this problem, for this problem. So let's look at definition six at the bottom. So the idea is that I'm actually, <laughs> now let's go up. So I would, like to, uh, I would like to do the following. I'm interested in Sidon sets of size T, right? Let me write T here, big. So that's what I want, T, uh, Sidon set of size T. But now suppose that I have at the beginning some S, a Sidon set S of size little s, which is less than T. And I ask myself in how many ways I can add T minus S vertices to this set S uh, to have a Sidon set of size T. So I have S is already fixed. I ask myself in how many ways I can add S prime to have a Sidon set of size little t, right? Okay, so what we do is the following. So we use the original set S, big S of size little s to define a graph. And this collision graph in definition six is the graph. So, okay. We do the following. So the graph has vertex set brackets and minus s. And uh, we join two vertices x and y. Uh, x and y in brackets and minus s. Uh, if there are two elements a and b in s such that you have this equation. Uh, so that means that, okay, so what does that mean? That means that uh, if I look at this graph and I decide, for instance, to include Y 
uh, in my independent in my set S prime. So this is what I'm trying to add to the original Sidon set to obtain a Sidon set of size t, right? So if I decide to add y, I cannot add x because I would have this violation x plus a equals y plus b. Anyway, so there is a way of defining a graph and saying that in this graph, what I'm interested in is the number of independent sets. And what we have to, and what we do is to apply the previous lemma uh, concerning the graph. Of course, to, to apply this lemma, you have to check this condition too. But using the fact that the set S is a Sidon set, the original set S is a Sidon set, you can prove uh, too. But unfortunately, I will not go into details about that. Mm. Anyway, so when you do that, uh, when you use this philosophy of starting with some S and then building up, um, or what I just said kind of gives you some recurrence like this. You can write a recurrence for the number of Sidon sets of, a, of some number of elements. You start with some set uh, little s, so little s shows up here and here, uh, and then you ask yourself whether I can add uh, t minus s vertices, right, uh, to obtain a Sidon set of size t. Uh, and then t minus s is written as a q plus r because that uh, lemma required me to do that. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure whether this kind of makes so much sense, but um, so this is the proof strategy. Uh, now, I, I wanted to say something about infinite Sidon set. So instead of going too much into that explanation, let me kind of change gear. Let me now talk about infinite Sidon sets. Uh, right now, uh, what we want to do is, is to consider Sidon sets n in, in, in the natural numbers. And uh, to measure how big or how dense the set is, we use the standard counting function, so Sn. Sn is- Excuse me, J just a second, a, a sort of philosophical question. Uh, okay. How different are infinite Sidon sets from finite Sidon sets? Oh that yeah, so yeah, that's kind of a, an, an amazing fact. Uh, so you have this, we, we spoke about finite Sidon sets so far, right? So S in brackets N. Now we consider infinite sets and we measure, uh, I suppose the natural, uh, the first way you would measure density of Sidon set would be by using this counting function Sn. So you consider the, some in, the initial segment brackets N intersect with your infinite Sidon set S, you see how many elements you see there. And you would like this function to grow. Right, so this you would like Sn to grow fast, right? Uh, and this is actually a famous problem. So how fast can Sn grow? And it, it, and this is not known. So we know Fn. So if you just fix n and ask how large a Sidon set you can find in brackets n, you know pretty precisely. You know it's asymptot asymptotic to root n, right? But if you want to do it for all n at the same time, you don't know how, how well you can do. But I mean, the, the understanding is that most Sidon sets that you do up to n can't be continued, right? Can't be continued well. Right, Th there's... right. sure. Okay. Right, uh -huh. yeah, so it's, it's uh, so nobody knows how to stick together all these uh, very large root n Sidon sets uh, for several n, uh, infinite, uh, up to infinity. Uh, actually, so what is the growth that is known for Sn is something like n to the square root two minus one. Uh, yeah, this will come up later in some graphs. It will be easier for me to say. So now I'm interested in this probabilistic problem, uh, probabilistic or extreme or probabilistic problem. So I have to say now what I mean by a random set of integers, an infinite random set of integers. Uh, we do something pretty natural, I, I suppose. Uh, we fix some constant delta between zero and one. And for every m, uh, we define p of m, the probability that m is in the set, to be m raised to minus one to the delta. 
right? So we define this probability PM and we generate a random set R. Actually, I think uh, later on I will call, will, I will call R, R of delta. Uh, in the most, uh, in the simplest way, we add uh, the integer m to the random set with probability pm, everything independent. So there's a very simple model for a random subset of the natural numbers. This is this is the model that Erdős and Renny used to uh, to uh, imitate primes, right? For the right. appropriate right. choice of yeah. okay. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Very good. Or to study Sidon sets also. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So. Uh, so again, we have this random. Yeah, I, I just meant I meant powers, of course. You know, the cubes mm. or squares. So. Oh, uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, right. So we have the random set. You have the probability of every point, and and what is the question now? The question is kind of the analogous question. We would like to find some constant f delta, right? Such that uh, if you consider your random set R delta you can find inside R delta, so there is uh, a Sidon set S contained in R delta with growth function like this, N to the F delta. Right, so I have this random set. I would like to find a large or yeah, a dense Sidon set inside. Uh, and I will measure that by the, by the counting function and my, my problem is to find the exponent of n for the growth func for the counting function of the Sidon set. So this would be the lower bound, let's say, right? And uh, of course the, the upper bound is, uh, I would like to, well, again, we consider the random set R delta and we, would, we have to prove, we would like to prove that every Sidon set contained in R delta has counting function at most n to the G delta. So my problem now is to, to estimate compute f delta and g delta, right? Now, again, you kind of get the same function, uh, same kind of picture. Uh, so here's the theorem uh, uh, stated in, in the form of a picture. Um, so again, so I have this, we have this random set as we just defined. We want to know about Sidon sets in R delta we obtain f of delta and g of delta as defined in the previous uh, slide as in the graph here. So in other words, uh, we know that if delta, mm, yeah, so if delta, so the x axis here now is delta. So if delta is between zero and one third, then it grows kind of linearly. Actually, maybe first thing, let me say something. Uh, very basic first. Uh, what happens with, with your random set? Your random set has counting function n to the delta, right? Uh, so this, the R of delta equals delta, the identity function here in this graph is the, let's say density of the random set, is the growth of the random set. Now, uh, the largest Sidon set up to one third, it's kind of, there isn't much to say, it grows the same way. Now, again, you have this flat region if delta is between one third and two thirds. Uh, now, we can prove that uh, G of delta, so the upper bound is like this. It goes as in the graph that we had in the previous theorem. So all of this comes from the counting. So it's, it's possible to adapt those, to use those counting results to prove this upper bound G of delta. Now, unfortunately for the lower bound, we, know, we don't know much. So for the lower bound, uh, we only have this flat lower bound and then some very simple kind of uh, uh, fun growing function here hitting this root two minus one, which is the best people know uh, for the largest Sidon set or fastest growth of a Sidon setting in, in the natural numbers. So Rouge's theorem. So that's the best exponent uh, one knows. So when, when Delta equals one, uh, so when you have all of the natural numbers, 
you don't know the correct growth. There's a gap, uh, root two minus one to one half. So of course we cannot hope to do much, but uh, anyway, so it would be nice if you could uh, fill this gray area with the correct function at least. So I find, I, 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 I would be very interested in knowing what happens at two thirds, whether, so when you go a little bit above two thirds, what happens with the growth of an infinite uh, Sidon set in this model? Um, actually, yeah, right. So this is, so this is what we say. So we have this graph and uh, from two thirds to one, we only have this upper bound and lower bound and the actual, the correct answer, the answer is somewhere in this gray region and we don't know where it is. Uh, okay, now to approach this problem, we kind of invented something because we could use it. Uh, so we, we defined um, a set S to be an alpha strong Sidon set uh, if you have this for any four elements of your set. Uh, in other words, in a Sidon set, you want the pairwise sums to be different. So you want the difference to be at least one. We want the difference to be, uh, let's say, the, yeah, the largest guy to raise to some power alpha. So think of alpha as being one tenth or something. So we really want the pairwise differences to be different from one another, right? And if you could uh, construct, if you could prove that there are dense alpha strong Sidon sets, so Sidon sets, alpha strong Sidon sets S such that the counting function Sn grows fast. So like N to the H alpha, then you would be able to prove lower bounds uh, for the function F. So let me go back to the previous page. So you would be able to improve this pink thing that I drew from two thirds to one. So that was kind of the reason why we, we started studying this. And we could prove, uh, we could construct some alpha strong Sidon sets for sm very small alpha uh, with growth, kind of non-trivial growth. Uh, but, but later uh, Fabian, Ruhe and Spiegel proved, them, proved a much better result. They, they could even do strong Oh, I should say here, strong uh, BH sets. So not only Sidon sets, but strong uh, BH sets. So they, we were based on some ideas, we we're based on some ideas, um, combinatorial ideas of uh, Ruja. They use Sileruelo's construction of uh, Sidon sets. And, and anyway, so they could do much better. And uh, so what you have, uh, I, I didn't draw the graph, I, maybe I should have drawn the graph. Let me just say that they, they obtain something like, yeah, they obtain some lower bound like this red function I kind of just drew. It's not a linear function, it's kind of, it's a curve, but anyway, so they can do better. They hit root two minus one because they are kind of doing Sileruelo, um, but then they, they can move away from this trivial lower bound that we had before. Uh, anyway, and uh, finally, uh, for BH sets, we can prove a counting result. Uh, so here's the counting result. Uh, you, perhaps you remember that the main function, kind of the count, the main term in the counting for Sidon sets was like this, n divided by t squared to the t. Uh, but for BH sets, uh, you kind of ha you have the same form, but you have this minus epsilon in the denominator in the exponent of denominator, so t to the h minus epsilon. Uh, the proof here is kind of much more. It's much messier. It's uh, we also have a lower bound which gives a function of the same form. Um, again, it's true that if you are below the threshold of n to the one over two h minus one, that's the n to the one third that appeared before. 
uh, the most sets are, or most sets, or many sets are BH. Uh, we even kind of think that maybe, maybe so, maybe some, someone should find a kind of a much simpler proof of, of this theorem. And, uh, and then probably you can get rid of epsilon. So probably you can prove n divided by t to the h raised to the t uh, for the number of t element bh sets contained in brackets n. Well, as long as t is above some threshold. Um, OK, and then if be, because of this counting, you can consider the extremal problem, the random extremal problem, probabilistic extremal problem I spoke about for BH sets. And you kind of get the same, you, 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 you again get the same graph. You get a graph which is kind of goes like this and then it's flat and then it grows. Um, okay, uh, right, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was very nice. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there um, other questions for our speaker? Really very interesting. Maybe I stop sharing. Yeah, so these questions, when you go from finite to infinite uh, sit-on sets are really very subtle, very I mean, complicated things. Yeah. So I'm curious, you're in a computer science department. Um, right. Is this in any way related to anything that you do connected with computers? Mm, well, so additive combinatorics, Kind of is playing a role in in uh, complexity theory is but uh, it's not that I I have done anything substantially in that way, so kind of I have an excuse to study kind of these things. Uh, I can really kind of relate to to complexity theory, let's say. Right. Oh, okay. Well, let me thank the speaker again. Um, well, thank you very much. Oh, wait a minute, Moshe, do you have a question? Well, uh, a question from my father. Are, are there any, I mean, all of these things are long-term asymptotic behavior. Does, does anybody know how to calculate the exact values of these things for small numbers? I mean, you know, besides brute force uh, computations on a computer? Mm, I don't know much about that. Mm. I mean, presumably that the numbers must be known up to some very small point, right? First five or six yes. or something. Mm -hmm. uh, would you would you happen to know where they're available? No, I'm I'm afraid not. No, I don't. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm also wondering about that. I mean, I don't know if Kevin is still here because. Yeah. No. Yeah, right. So multiplicative Sidon sets. Yeah, right. So yeah, I didn't say anything about that, right? About that, right? But uh, Hong Liu and uh, Peter Paul Pach have some very nice results about the multiplicative versions of this, uh, of these counting problems. Uh, actually, those are problems that are mentioned in, in Cameron Erdős. Uh, they have pretty precise results, but they are kind of different. Maybe there's, uh, yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's correct to say that there's more number theory there. <clears throat> Everything what we did here was combinatorial, right? <clears throat> Sorry. Well, okay, thank you again, everyone. Um, thank you. Stay well, stay healthy. Um, um, be jealous of all the people who are not stuck in a foot and a half of snow. Yes, I have a is, fan. It warm, is it warm in Brazil right now? Very. Actually, you see, I see now that the computer 
there, there was some overheating problem of the computer. So I took a fan, which was fanning me, <laughs> and I made it fan the computer. <laughs> I don't know whether you can, yeah, you can hear. But it's summertime now in, in Seattle. Yeah, Hello, that's right. right. Yeah, and it's hot. Uh, it, it's been quite hot. It's kind of 30. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, pretty hot for us. Okay. <laughs> Here it's not. I yeah. My window and all I see is white. It's yeah, great. Right. <laughs> Actually, the only bad thing about this COVID at the moment is they closed our university because of the snow but they only closed it for things that were on campus. So if you teach on oh. Zoom, of course, we still have to teach. So, yeah. uh, you know, we used to look forward to a snow day, but, uh, cause you could stay at home, but now you're stuck at home uh, and you still have to teach. So yeah. <laughs> what can you do? Okay, everybody, take care. Um, there will be a speaker next week. I'm not quite sure who yet, but we'll send out the announcement. And um, we have the month of, Mar month of March almost filled up, but uh, not the last couple of weeks in February yet. Uh, okay, y'all, um, stay well, stay healthy. Um, run away from the virus if it starts to attack you. <laughs> Thank you again, Mel, so bye-bye. No, thank you very much. It was really very interesting. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.